Wow, we are at the very end. I can't believe it's been such a long day, but this has been amazing. I have so many great ideas floating around my head. I know you do too, but I'm going to ask you not to think about that just yet because this is the best. So this is Debbie Reynolds, and she is going to talk about snowballs and hell. This is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. So thank you, Debbie. And I guess, um, yeah, you guys want to start the video? Good afternoon. My name is Debbie Reynolds. They call me the Data Diva. Thank you so much for allowing me to be the keynote presenter uh, for the Privacy and Equity Conference. Special thanks to Heidi Sass for inviting me and also for the Data Collaboration Alliance for hosting this great event. Uh, this has been a fantastic conference and I'm happy to be able to give the keynote address. So today my presentation it's called Snowballs and Hill, uh, why is passing a US federal data privacy legislation so challenging? This is a big issue. Uh, people all over the world, especially in the US, can't quite figure out why in the US we're having so much trouble in passing uh, federal uh, data privacy legislation. We're seeing around the world, especially in Europe, a lot of regulations coming out of Europe around data and information. And I think, you know, consumers are frustrated, companies are frustrated. This is an issue that isn't necessarily political or partisan, uh, I would say. Uh, so people from all walks of life feel like there needs to be some type of control or regulation in the U.S. around data privacy, and they're looking for leadership in the U.S. on this issue. So I thought I would discuss with you all why this is a problem and why this is a challenge and what we can do about it in the future. Share my screen. All right. So the reason why I call it Snowballs and Hill, uh, because it feels like there's not a snowball's chance in hell that we will ever get uh, data privacy legislation on the federal level. Uh, I think eventually it may happen uh, one day, uh, but I think if, as a first pass, it may be something that may not be as strong as people may like it. Uh, but here are some of the things that are holding us back. And then here are some ideas at the end about how we can move forward and do better. All right, so roadblocks to U.S. federal privacy law. There are many different roadblocks that we're, we're seeing. I thought it'd be uh, important to elucidate what these things are so that people understand the true challenges. It's not as easy as people may think it may be, uh, but here are the challenges that are holding us back. First of all, the U.S. Constitution does not contain an express right to privacy. Uh, some rights to privacy in the Constitution are more inferred or situational. The top one that people think about a lot is uh, the Fourth Amendment right uh, to undo search and seizure, to uh, prohibit that. But that is a right having to do with um, the government and their ability to, to be able to go into people's physical surroundings. Uh, so as you know, at the time that the Constitution was, was created, you know, technology didn't exist. Uh, there were no computers, there were no smartphones, there were no drones. So the I, this idea is rather outdated in terms of what it means around, uh, you know, privacy. And, and because it's not expressly mentioned in the constitution, I think that we're seeing laws and regulations or even rulings, like for example, the, the Roe v. Wade ruling uh, fall recently in 2022. Part of that is because, you know, those rights are not codified in the constitution. So, um, you know, having rulings, having, you know, things like executive orders, things like that, that are passed around privacy aren't really strong enough. Uh, so that's why we really want laws and regulations to be passed to create 
um, you know, for my point of view, I would love to have a constitutional right, the fundamental privacy as a human right. Uh, I'd also like to see more legislation around the rights of humans. So we have sector specific uh, and data uses. So the federal laws that we have right now that have privacy in it at all are related to typically sector specific uses. So we definitely have HIPAA for healthcare. We have gram leach Bliley for finance. We have the COPPA, which is the Children's Privacy Online Act. We also have um, a privacy act that was passed in the 1970s for the government, but that, that is around the government's use of data. So there's a lot of fragmentation around how data is handled, uh, especially because you think of yourself, okay, I'm a human, I should have rights to privacy no matter what I'm doing and where I'm going. But the way that, that privacy rights have been articulated in our regulations in the U.S. thus far have been very commerce related and sort of data specific use related. So that's what we this is definitely a challenge because uh, if we continue along this line and more sector and data use specific, there are always going to be gaps. Uh, the U.S. differs very greatly uh, from places like uh, the EU and other places around the world that have privacy as a fundamental human right in their constitution, uh, which means that the human has that right from cradle to grave. Uh, and then actually China beyond the grave. Uh, and then so they can exercise those rights and then organizations, regardless of who they are, uh, you know, with limited exceptions have to respect those rights. All right, Congress. Uh, so we've seen in our political di discourse over the years that it has been very difficult to get Congress to agree on most anything. Um, actually, this is is ironic around privacy because there seems to be bipartisan support in some ways for protecting privacy rights. However, Congress has had a hard time trying to agree, come up with bills. Uh, I think the last count I had is that there have been over a hundred bills in Congress, either in the House or Senate, that have been proposed around some level some segment or sliver of privacy and haven't gone very far. There are also industry groups, um, lobbyists, political action committees, uh, people who are either against uh, uh, having a federal privacy regulation or they want privacy le legislation to be of the flavor that they like it to be. So there is um, a wide disagreement. I guess there's agreement there's something that should be done. There's disagreement on what should be done and how much of it should be done. All right. So the Federal Trade Commission. So the Federal Trade Commission currently under the leadership of Lisa Kahn has kind of energized this privacy debate. Uh, the FTC uh, uh, it's over commerce in the U.S., so a lot of our privacy laws come out of that commerce language uh, and philosophy, so that's what the FTC rules over. So the FTC can't pass laws, but they can enforce laws. So there's been a lot of pressure to have Congress pass a law that the FTC can then enforce, but the FTC, what they're trying to do is look at the old laws that are on the books, try to up enforcement on that. They put out many letters and blog posts on certain things that maybe hadn't had very robust enforcement in the past. And they're gonna start doing that. And then also uh, one thing that the FTC recently started was a rulemaking process. So rulemaking, rules aren't laws, rules are rules, right? Like orders, like chores, like someone says, clean up your room, right? Uh, so that's kind of what rulemaking is. The issue with rulemaking is that the rule make, rulemaking is a very long process. So even though the FTC is doing more an abbreviated version of, of rulemaking, a typical rulemaking process goes like five or six years on average. Average. So, uh, you know, this is a long, long, uh, 
long, long process. Um, it remains to be seen how this is going to go. Um, also, rules can be changed by Congress. So let's say Congress can create a law and pass a law, and it could, you know, sort of squash what's happening in this rulemaking process. So I think the thought is, let's not. The FTC doesn't want to wait for Congress to create a law. They want to be able to do something ahead of time. All right, states' rights. So states, this is interesting. So states can pass laws faster than Congress because it's obviously more, more people in Congress, more opinions, more thoughts. As I said, it's been very difficult to have Congress pass legislation of almost any kind. Uh, but this one is one that people have kind of high issues about. So states can pass laws related to privacy faster because of, they have a little bit less red tape. Uh, but also states have different rights than the federal government. So the way that the, the states are assembled, states have their own level of sovereignty around what they pass in law. So for example, states, let's say for example, uh, Illinois. So Illinois passed the law um, called BIPA, the Biometric Information Privacy Act. And BIPA is what they call a general applicability law, which means that it isn't sector specific, like kind of the FTC and stuff like that. As a result, um, some of the proposals and actually one of the, the top proposals that is out there right now for a federal privacy legislation, which is the ADPP, uh, cannot... The ADPP wants to preempt uh, state uh, privacy laws and regulations. Um, I'll get into that a little bit later. But uh, that uh, ADPP cannot preempt BIPA. Okay, so this is a concern because at the last count, BIPA fines have, I think they've almost reached a billion dollars over the last several years. So if a federal law that's proposed can't stop a law like BIPA, like what exactly is preemption going to do, right? So I think that that's an open question that people really need to think about because I think people don't really understand the federal, federal, um, the federal government's rights and what they can do and what the states can do. So a federal privacy law can't stop states from passing laws like BIPA. Um, and also, I think that, uh, you know, there are certain things the federal government can do um, uh, that can make a law strong enough where preemption doesn't need to even be uh, a sticking point. The influence of California. Uh, so I can't understate this enough. Uh, California is a very influential state. Uh, it is, uh, let's see, it is the most populous state in the U.S. Uh, 13 of every 100 people in the U.S. is from California. Uh, California is the fifth largest economy in the world. Silicon Valley is in California, um, you know, and the hits keep coming, right? So there's a lot going on in California. California is a state, but it's not just any state. So it definitely has a special place. Uh, it has a special standing. California has been very progressive on privacy legislation uh, for over 50 years. Uh, they have had privacy as a fundamental right in their constitution since the 1970s. They've consistently passed laws, you know, even teeny laws that people don't even think about um, uh, over those 50 years. And it's kind of culminated in what we see today with their CCPA and soon their C CPRA. Also starting in January, or actually already assembled, um, California will be the only state in the U.S. will have its own agency to handle privacy. So I feel like California is sort of on track with more aligned with what's happening in Europe and other countries uh, where they're saying privacy is important. We need laws around privacy. We need agencies to handle this as a separate thing, um, where in the federal government, 
your privacy currently is something that is enforced by the FTC. Again, the FTC does not regulate all industries. So that's kind of a narrow scope, I feel, around privacy, even though the, the FTC has a lot of power and a lot of a lot of reach in terms of what they can do in enforcement. Um, you know, it, it really isn't, in my view, sufficient um, because it doesn't cover all humans. It's mostly consumer. So if you're not consuming some of these rights that people feel like they should have, they really can't exercise. Also, uh, a couple things about California people may not understand. Uh, before the California had the CCPA, they had many other little privacy laws. Uh, I'll tell you at least about one. Um, California was the first state to have a law to say you had to have a privacy policy on your website. Um, so this, you know, now I think nowadays people just assume that this is just sort of common knowledge of carbon cup and parlance uh, when people are talking about privacy about privacy policies and privacy notices so they're definitely um influential and progressive in that way currently the speaker of the house uh in the u.s senate is nancy pelosi who's also uh from california uh currently the the people who are in charge of things like ccpa in california the delegates, the people, elected officials in California have almost all been for having federal privacy legislation, as long as it doesn't preempt their activities and what they're doing in California. So I think it's a good point. Um, I actually support that. Um, I feel like a federal privacy law should be a floor and not a ceiling. Uh, so I think I don't think it should preempt. I think if the law is strong enough, other states will not want to or need to uh, pass other uh, legislation uh, to try to compete with that, with those things. All right, preemption. So preemption is uh, the big thing that is holding up federal privacy legislation. Actually, two things. So preemption is a huge thing. So preemption, meaning that the federal government can come in, pass a law that will uh, cut or preempt what other states are doing. Currently, uh, preemption, the only state right now in the U.S. it would more most impact will be California because California has the most laws and regulations around privacy. Uh, again, they've been the most progressive thus far. Uh, most, uh, I'll give you an example about uh, California. So another example, California was the first state to have a data breach notification law. As of uh, 2019, all states have data breach notification laws, uh, but they're all different in every state. And so what we're seeing is as California is taking the lead on privacy, other states are getting into the mix and they're passing their own laws on privacy. So uh, I think the concern is we don't want privacy legislation to be like data breach notification legislation where there is basically a patchwork of laws, very different in every state. Uh, so they don't want that to happen, which I, I agree with. Uh, but I think, um, you know, being able to be a leader in privacy means kind of getting there first. So I think, I think in order to have the type of privacy that we need, we need to not only look to the future and what we want in the future, but also deal with these cracks and these gaps that we have or that are being created when people are thinking about creating legislation. All right, the other huge sticking point um, that we have when we're trying to think about federal data privacy legislation is a private right of action. So uh, companies don't want to get sued. They want don't want to have lawsuits against them for privacy uh, infringements. They don't want you know fines and different things like that. Um, so uh, many corporations, many companies that want 
privacy legislation do not want a private right of action, meaning that they don't want situations where consumers or individuals can sue against them. So, um, you know, a lot of lobbying, a lot of discussions, a lot of drafts of legislation have come out. Uh, and some of the, the privacy laws at state levels, some states uh, take the private right of action out. Um, and, you know, some people aren't really keen about that. Um, you know, I think California has a little bit of different thing. Obviously, the AG or the uh, the uh, supervisory authority in California can file lawsuits. Um, it does have a sort of private right of action, probably not direct, not like Illinois, the BIPA law that definitely has a private right of action. And we're seeing, as I said, almost a billion dollars in, in fines or settlements that have happened as a result of people who go against that law. I think, you know, I think there can be more discussions on private right of action. You know, for me personally, I don't necessarily feel like uh, if there is a private right of action, it may not necessarily have to happen at a federal level. You know, maybe having a law at a federal level that allows the states to decide how private right of action, if any, happens. Uh, that may be a way forward to help kind of this, this log jam or help us to be able to get past the situation that we have now where it's hard for us to be able to get agreement on privacy laws. Awareness. Uh, do Americans fully understand what is private or what is not private in the U.S.? So we have a huge challenge in the U.S. Uh, because people, a lot of people don't know what their privacy rights are. Um, I think people assume that they have more rights than they have. You know, I think they equate privacy with freedom, uh, like freedom of speech, freedom of expression. Uh, but because privacy isn't like explicitly in the Constitution, uh, there are, for example, uh, uh legal doctrine doctrines like the third party doctrine that says if you have your data if a third party has your data it doesn't have the same rights that you would have for like let's say fourth amendment rights uh i guess uh, a reasonable search and seizure and then also because corporations have this data they don't have to to follow that right so i think being able to understand or be able to uh communicate with people so that they understand actually what their rights are and what they can do is very important we're seeing in a situation, especially with the Dobbs ruling, where uh, women and people who care for women uh, are really getting more knowledgeable about what is private and what is not. There have been raging debates about should people have period tracking apps and things like that. You know, how can they protect themselves um, if they feel like their their privacy or you know their intimate details may be up for grabs. So. I think more awareness is needed, more education is needed, more conferences like this are definitely needed because we can't just have ivory tower conversations about privacy and think that things are going to change. All right, uh, consumer versus human. So in the U.S., we have more consumer-based rights versus uh, human-based rights like in Europe. So in the U.S., because privacy is more consumer-focused and more commerce-oriented, is not human-focused. So I use an example. If someone walks into a grocery store in California, grocery store may have like a loyalty program. They may be subject to laws like the CCPA. Uh, but if they walk across the street to a church, if that church has their data, they don't have to comply with that, right? Because they're exempted under the CCPA. So this is an example of a gap that we have in the U.S. between human versus consumer rights. And I'm hoping to see more legislation or more laws in the U.S. to try to cover that issue. So what is our horizon for federal U.S. privacy? So... Right now, there are two two bills. There are a lot of more more bills, but two that need you need to know about. 
uh, that are uh, in limbo in 2022. Uh, they are the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, the ADPPA, and the Fourth Amendment is Not for Sale Act. So there's a lot of talk about the ADPPA. Uh, it was proposed early this year, I think in June, uh, sort of came out of nowhere. I'm sure that there have been talks going on uh, uh, for a while about this, but uh, you know, the hold up there is preemption, uh, mostly. Uh, and part of it is private right of action. Part of it is, is what's going on with California, uh, who's currently blocking uh, this bill from going forth. I think that, you know, it remains to be seen what's going to happen. We're, we're going into an election now. It's uh, going to be interesting to see if anything is done with this, maybe in the lame duck session of Congress, or in the next Congress, whoever's elected, they're going to pick this up. There's also a bill called the Fourth Amendment is not for sale. Uh, so this bill is trying to close that third party doctrine loophole where people's private data doesn't have the same protection if it is held by a third party. So both of these, I wrote out kind of the process of getting a, a bill into law. So these, both of these bills are in the introduction stage, even though there's been a lot of activity, we haven't gotten very far. So this is not, this doesn't bode well for the future. I'm hoping that we can eventually uh, get this stuff passed by a Senate in the House and the President and have things become a law. So what can I do? What can you do to support U.S. federal privacy legislation? It's very important that you vote. Uh, voting is important. The representatives for your, your local uh, state and federal elections, they need to know how you feel about privacy. Write those leaders um, to let them know how you feel about it. Uh, support organizations that fight for your privacy rights. There are many um, uh, organizations within the U.S. and, and internationally. Um, I, I guess a couple of them would be like uh, the ACLU, uh, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, those types of organizations that are really trying to do something with privacy and try to create more grassroots awareness there. Uh, use products and services that respect and protect your privacy. So you know, vote with your dollar as well. Uh, if you find a, a tool that you like, if you have to compare two things, one is more privacy respecting, you know, use that tool. I think that's a message. And seek out awareness about privacy and privacy rights because this is very important to all of us. So feel free to contact me. I'm, uh, here's my information. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn, Data Diva. Uh, Debbie Reynolds on LinkedIn, and I'm be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much. That was awesome, Debbie. Thank you so much. Uh, you're on mute right there. Hey, Debbie. Right. We've only got like three minutes left. Um, and I want to say thank you so much for joining us and thank you everybody for such a great day. Um, I, I want to, I want to give you the last three minutes. Um, we, we didn't, we didn't have too many questions. I think because people didn't want to ask questions because it was a video. Um, but I loved your presentation. You know, I love your presentation. I always do. Um, but I want to say thank you again for doing this. And, um, if people do have questions, let me know. The live stream is just going to cut us off because they only have a four hour limit. So when we get to the limit in three minutes, they're just going to shut us down. So we've maxed out two full sessions of the four hour streaming limit. Yeah, I know. Right. And I thought it was great. I also want people to know that we're going to try to package these talks and individual talks to give them to the speakers so they can use them as marketing materials for their own business. You did the work to do the presentation. I think you should be able to use the work for your business. Um, so we're going to get those together and get those out to people soon. So people um, will have access to watch the replays as well. And that's coming soon. So, all right. What you got, Debbie? This is fantastic. Thank you so much. I think you know, privacy is something that impacts all of us. So the more we can have conversations that aren't, you know, in, in universities and then, you know, uh, you know, people with uh, leather patches on their, you know, blazer or whatever uh, conversations, the better it is. And I think, I don't know, you've had the same experience. You have people say they don't care about privacy, but then when you tell them about something personally, 
that oh, yeah. infringe on their privacy, they're like heated, right? So mm -hmm. we need to get people really heated and get them really understanding what the danger is, what the harm is, and why it's important. Yeah, we don't need awareness. We need outrage because that's actually going to get motion. Yeah, we've got awareness. We need people to get more excited about the awareness they got and get to the level of outrage so that we can push our lawmakers to do something. I agree. So, yeah. Wonderful. I, I, fantastic. I hope they listen to us because we've been telling them some good stuff today about what <laughs> I hope so too. I hope so too. Well, yeah, thank I you so much. Some, I got some fans of the FTC. I won't call them out, but I do have some fans over there. So like, yeah, you never know who's listening. And a lot of these things, people watch the replays more than they watch the live events. So our word mm -hmm. is getting out there. This, this has been a success and I think it was fantastic. Um, I got a question for you real quick. You got one minute on the EO. Is it, is it gonna, is it gonna happen in six months or, or is it not? Um, uh... Yeah, no. I don't, well, you know what? Yes, they're gonna slow walk it for two years. So, the, <laughs> the, the, yes. the executive order really just means what Biden says while he's in office, right? So that's two years. So yeah, that's what that is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. And since we're all agreed, shrimps three it is. Two yeah. Yes. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you so much. It, it is gonna shut us off. But thank you so much, everybody. This was a great day. I wish we had more time for questions, but you can reach us on LinkedIn.